Venkatji, can you repeat your question? Okay, so Pranit, my question is in the uh, real-time feature capturing as well as real-time modeling, so exchanging models and uh, on the real-time models. Can we talk about that? Oh, I see. So you're talking about large data coming in, business data, right? So you never know when a new account is being created by some customer. As soon as it is created, you have some lot of variables. Is that what you're referring to? Like exactly, exactly, right? So behave, for example, okay, so a food chain analysis. So what is happening in the real time, we don't know. So even including our weather forecasting. Oh, such Like an example I'm referring to the Uber meal. Mm -hmm. So they, they mentioned clearly like that, how they are capturing what is current situation and uh, how much it time takes to deliver and how much time it takes to driver go and pick something. So sure. such, such kind of scenarios, how you will apply, what kind of techniques, how we should think real time sure. versus batch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can tell how I apply and also I can tell what is really being done. This is, a, this is an important part of the, the, the landscape in general, right? Because uh, okay, yeah. Anyway, yeah. This is this, this is something that happens very often. Very common question. This is very important actually. This situation that you'll that will arise in general, especially if you're in a, you don't have to be in a large company as long as you're dealing with large data sets. Some customer data, something is coming in, or you're capturing some data. Uh, yeah, it is very likely you'll be having a nice big data framework that is capturing a lot of data. Then the question is, how is the models and the machine learning is also able to exploit this? And you know, you don't have to wait for one hour or two hour latency just to get the results, right? That's the thing, like how do you deal with it? So that's a great question. Uh, so a couple things. Uh, what people usually do in very common is the following. The training of the model is more like an offline process. Of course, you can write some cron job to schedule uh, model retrainings. But even then, it is a job, right? It's a bad job, uh, especially when you're training on, say, one year's worth of customer data, uh, which might as well be, I don't know, 5 million records, I don't know, you know, 100 million records, whatever it is, the size of the company, uh, even 100,000 records, for example. It doesn't run like that in an instance. And then the training process is also being overseen by a human, right? Even if you're using a very nice automated system or software or something that you're downloading or some new startup that is able to do most of your training for you even then you have to give your final validation right it will not it will only do its job of training you feed it data it will train it and it will tell you it will try everything automatically tune everything at the most you know at the most uh, ideal setup otherwise even that tuning training everything you're doing it you're, you're walking it through so as you see it is a it is an offline process it takes a while then there is, you, you ideally also want to test it on your future data as part of this. So you would also probably put it on shadow mode uh, because if you train on six months old data and then train it on last two months data and test it on last two months data, you are cross validating on the six months, testing on the last two months. But even then, you're not testing it on current situation, right? You're, even your test set is in the past. Uh, but sometimes you might be in a situation where you do that, but you also sometimes you might want to train till yesterday's data and then test from today. But from today, you don't have data for 100 days or two months or three months. So then people sometimes put it in shadow mode. Uh, uh, but usually there's a lot of combinations of hybrid approaches of what is your train and test. So it is an offline process. But the good thing is once you have a model figured out and ready and deployed, uh, the, the, the prediction is a very is a lot quicker the predict there is a train part where you have a model ready then you have some function ready in the right configuration right that is your model then all you want to do is predict you don't want to change your configuration data goes in you do the predict there's some internal calculation happens you get the prediction out that is a lot faster uh, uh, in computational uh, work uh, to do the prediction so what people do is they take advantage of that um, and they basically uh, uh, pre predict uh, on batches so there is a there is a scheduler that uh, not even a scheduler there is like an uh, every few intervals right every five minutes or two minutes whatever data has come that goes into the predict job you get a batch prediction out and then that, that obviously then you flatten that or however you store it in whichever table or whatever form you store it the data again pipeline will take the predictions from there because it is just one variable you're predicting your prediction is just one column it could be numbers probabilities it could be different classes 
uh, all that is then again sucked by the data pipeline of how you'll use it in your business in the tables uh, so that's what is done but sometimes there is always a question of pushing the limit now if i say even within 2 minutes i'm getting millions of records it depends what you're looking at right maybe you're looking at uh, really large data uh, related setup so in that case people use a lot more sophisticated mechanisms so um things like M amazon built for example to be able to scale on that situation using what is known as uh, elastic machine learning they have something which is kind of based on the elastic search uh, foundations in general but they build their own internal way of uh, deploying and making the predictions even more faster so there they do elastic ml so it's like a distributed setup and there's a lot of big data framework going on there um, and a lot of people don't even understand how it works we just use it uh, as another tool so we 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 have manuals for it we see what command needs to be done for train and we do all the manual looking at whether the training is done well but then we know how to deploy it and once you deploy it it it, it takes care of the situation because if the it's like a container uh, and if that has that elastic machine learning uh, setup then it can take care of the situation um and sometimes your data maybe the model sometimes the model actually the model in amazon it, it takes the data actually directly from s3 bucket sometimes for training so then if you have like 100 million records you don't even have to download it to your computer you, you put it in s3 you mention to the model where it the input data is so it takes it from there even in the training stuff um so that is how it is done uh Uh, in general that said there is a one more advanced solution that is also being implemented in big companies there is a this is again on the stat side or the science side of things uh, what i told till now is more on the data side so on the science side there is a framework called online learning uh, so there it is even the retraining is easier because it will it will keep changing its parameters the model parameters based on every uh every batch of input data that is flowing in for prediction so you don't have to train on one year's data then use it for three months then say model is old again train on one year's data so in the, even in the three months that you're using the model that you train on one year's data it will keep updating itself so your online learning it is learning on small even with small increments of data changes it is configuring itself uh, so there are online learning techniques there is online learning version of linear regression online learning version of logistic Uh, but not you don't have online learning for all techniques but many techniques have it so those are also used sometimes uh, but more than this elastic machine learning is more popular uh, at least in amazon yeah. <laughs> let me share my screen yeah. maybe you have some pipeline or something in mind you're showing i want build this kind of pipeline yeah. So here, if I see the data engineering side and data preparation and analytics, right? So here, build, score, model, visualize. So the, what I want to do, I want to define for every this block. Your score will be after the model, but yeah, I get it. Yeah. So that is what I'm looking for. I want to build some kind of a standard pipeline which can explain a generic way, a batch, a real time, or online or near real time. So that is what actually I was thinking, but we can talk about later. Sure. If you have something in your mind, you sure. can explain this box. How to define? What are the basic steps? For example, uh, if you think about the, let me put this way, right? If we, uh, if it is a EPL guy, is a data preparation in the uh, second box. What I do always, uh, this is my entire pipeline. Then first I'll take sourcing. Then I'll go to a basic validation, error handling. Then data quality. Then data transformation. Then data auditing. So this is what I always say, I'll say as a pipeline. So similarly, we should come up with some idea for modeling. That's what I'm thinking. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So if here any data comes, either batch or real time, regardless, your underlining source is, is the data. You underlining your source record, source of record. Yeah, the yeah. Source of record is landed into the landing area, means your S3. In your case, you you said right. Mm-hmm. This is a landing is S3. 
then the training part will begin once you yeah. of course there will be some data there also you might do some data pre processing exactly data so, quality and all that but then yes so validation yeah, yeah all that will happen then training right here i want focus more okay how how to do yeah, like training is mostly bad job but you can have a, some cron job some scheduler scheduling if, if you want to pre if you this is called model management because it's not about one model right the company might or group might deal with 20 model 10 model 5 models so then Correct. every time you don't want to monitor every, at least you should have a metrics dashboard where it is monitoring the model performance how the roc curve is how the precision recall like all the metrics are then at least the company can make decisions the business can look at or uh, maybe metrics every week or every two weeks and say okay now this particular third model we are using for so and so is not working well it's uh, it's become too old we have to retrain that is one way to take a you uh, went to retrain and then give that job to someone he will retrain it and deploy it. <coughs> another so, thing is, so in yeah in, in, that is not popular but sometimes people try to think about model management pipeline can we build a pipeline to automatically manage multiple models and click on one button it will retain itself because we know how much data we are feeding what variables we already figured that out all that thing. but that again makes it more complicated um, also on your streaming data this is a training so it is a more slower process but the testing is where you want more real time so say you have data from kafka or something which is literally streaming data then yeah so then uh, yeah either you do near real time which is batch processing of, because prediction runs fast, uh, it won't take that much time, little latency. Uh, but if you, otherwise you want to keep it even nice and clean, then you have to use something like machine learning based on Elasticsearch, that is one stack, or you, machine learning based on Spark as well. Uh, hmm. Because there is a library called MLlib, MLlib in Spark has uh, all the pythons and, I'm oh, sorry, all the random forests and everything. Uh, so ML is coming as a part of training you're talking? Uh, okay. Yeah, because if you say if you stick to Spark, right, then you have to do training in Spark, testing in Spark. If you stick to R in local system, training in R, testing in R, right? Yeah. So yeah. So, but then I've heard uh, there is a lot of head. This is an, again soft uh, opinion from what I heard from other people is if you want to move into Spark, you have to be very careful about it because. Uh, Maybe the data engineer understands the whole Spark framework a lot better, uh, but then it is really hard to Im implement newer models or make model changes for someone who is just doing data science if he doesn't know Spark enough, you know, because your whole company is now running on Spark stack for the prediction. So now, you know, my case, uh, what I'm understanding, you just now you explained, right? So data validation is nothing but maybe data quality what maybe we'll apply same as ETL transformation now yeah. it's not nulls and everything yeah something that uh, model can run on finally correct yeah. validation okay. is nothing but yeah here validation is like uh, maybe I don't know validation comes before or after so when you say yeah so if you if the validation is for data quality then you can call it also data quality so there is definitely one validation for the model performance which comes after with training after. okay training okay. and model validation it's like a loop you train, 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 validate, train, validate. You tune basically, or you can say model tuning and validation. You can put it. In. So then you know, here I can say validation, right? So here first. Yeah, but it's a feedback loop. You train with some parameters. You see how it is. Then you again change parameters. Again validate. Again train. Again validate. Or you do cross validation. So yeah. Uh, okay. But even after you finish your yeah, it is valid actually to put there because even after you did all that figuring out. Then you at least have some configuration, right? Then you say, okay, this is my trained model. Even that, you want to validate how it is doing on test set and everything. How the okay. RSC curve is, so yeah. So, yeah. so I, I need your help to understand. So these are the items. For example, part of training, we talked about ROC curve and couple yeah. of items, right? This is what exactly we have to define. If a generic way, if someone asks a question, yes. hey, what is your pipeline? I say, I'll get a file, I'll put in S3, I'll do data quality validation. Okay, data quality done. Then after that, I will build a model let's call it a instead of training maybe the build so that pipeline you're asking for the question i can actually answer in like just one line actually obviously we can but in one line if i put all you have to do is choose one or more techniques okay okay and then if you're going with one there is no other choice to make but if you have more then you can in the end you will choose the one that performs but choose one or more techniques and uh, perform cross validation so you mean so you mean these all circles which I'm pointing all the models which are techniques? Yeah, random forest, logistic. Okay, 
But uh, ran, random forest, uh, random, yeah. random forest yeah. logistic regression, these all are yeah. giving, giving like a, how the data looks, how the patterns only, right? That is not the real model. People call it a model, right? So it is not a what we both think, right? People do call it a model. It is a, like a mathematical model. That's what they mean when they say model. Not yeah, like, that, that's um, what I'm bit. That's what I'm bit uncomfortable. Sometimes people say that. Yeah, people, people do call it model. It, it yeah. is. It, yeah, you don't have to. I think you, should, you will get used to it because this is standard terminology sometimes. So we have to accept it. Um, SVM yeah. is called a model. Yeah, they call that a model as well. Their model means other things also. I guess. Yeah, so these are the. The, like, way, the way I'm thinking, the way I'm thinking, these all are like a techniques, and after that, based on this outcome, then you are applying some if else greater than or less than add plus minus together called model. That's what my. That is the, the good or bad thing is both are called model actually. So that yeah. is also model. This also this also they refer to as model. I'm using SVM as my model. This is what they like standard sentence. Okay. Yeah. I train my model using random forest. No, it's just they use model for both. Um, so you do this. Uh, so the one line is you choose one or more techniques, and then you apply cross validation to tune your technique. Which means cross validation means we studied it. It will be in the slide somewhere. You can search as well. They will try different parameters of SVM if you are using SVM and see which parameter works well. And there's a there's a methodology to do it. That methodology is called cross validation. So that happens in training stage. Cross oh, oh, okay. During training, you can, you can break it. Actually, you don't have to put everything there. I agree. The, from the training by validation thing, there you can put again three, four things. Fair enough. Or you can put one by yeah. Okay, here I'm doing cross validation. So one side build. Okay, building model. Well, cross validation. So, so there is even to be very specific. You have to split your data also. So you do so. Uh, after data quality, before into training, what is going is you're splitting your data into training and test set. Correct. Then training set only you will go into training ML because you don't want to train on test set. It's like seeing exam answers beforehand. So you train, training set and there you do cross validation is part of the training. Cross validation is helping you train basically. Yeah, that's true. Maybe anyway, uh, I don't want to waste time. Like, but overall, okay. you got my idea, right? What I'm trying to say, summarizing. Yeah, there is a visual, a visual representation. Yeah, there is a pipeline for sure, and uh, there is special case of worrying about how to deal with real time predictions. But otherwise, okay. we have batch pipeline for sure. Okay, cool. Thank you. So let's take. You can take the control now. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, but we are starting very late though. So I'm really. Uh, I have time, but I'm not sure what time we want to fix. Do we do the one hour class or any anyone any comments? Uh, like quick comments. I'm fine. I'm okay. Yeah. Yeah. I just okay. want to get feedback. Like if everyone is there. I want to do the one hour class. If everyone is not there, I want to you know. Do something like half an hour and then catch up next week. That's that's all I needed was some feedback. So, all right. Um, okay. So yeah, um, we are going to discuss. Uh, let me show you the syllabus. Um, what is known as a very popular techniques. One is called PCA. Uh, another is called multi-dimensional scaling, scaling, which is MDS. PCM means principal components analysis. That's the full. This part we're looking at. PCA, MDS. Um, these are basically unsupervised techniques. Are you sharing? Are you sharing something? Oh, actually, I am not. Thanks for bringing that up. I was, uh, yeah, I was sharing, but I didn't click my share screen. So, yeah, there we go. Yeah, I was just showing what we are going to be looking at now. This week is what we are looking at right now. Uh, especially, the, we are looking at two techniques: PCA, principal components analysis; MDS, multi-dimensional scaling. Uh, these are unsupervised techniques. Uh, so this is not so SVM random forest. It is supervised because you had some variable to predict or classify. Now here you only have input variable. So clustering, even week 11 was unsupervised. Week 12, let's say these two are continuous here. Clustering, you are just grouping your data into different groups, right? Uh, so that data within a group is similar to each other, but data between groups are different from each other. So where is ANOVA? So you mentioned last week you are going to talk about ANOVA week 10. Also. Yeah. We did not discuss that, about ANOVA. We did not discuss that. What we did was we discussed hypothesis testing, this thing, uh, type 1, type 2, or some tests. Then week 10 we have not discussed yet. Um, uh, but what I said was this thing I can, since we, this is the, again the foundation is here. We spend more time on this. Um, this can be done somewhat faster based on the foundations we covered in week nine. So I said I can, you know, 
uh, fit it in somewhere in a, in about half an hour or so. Um, let's see. We we spent a lot of time discussing. I mean, all the important stuff. So let's see where I will fit it in. I wanted to finish. This is like a one full topic. So I wanted to finish this first. Um, if this takes thirty minutes, then the other thirty I can spend on this. You know that kind of. Thing. Um, all right. That but that will completely come cover our course. So we touched like every topic without skipping. So let's aim to do these things. Um, so the thing, another thing I noticed uh, after the call yesterday was. My last time was when we did some clustering. I was able to explain most of spectral clustering, and then I was I was happy to do. Uh, then we came to a topic called eigen decomposition, and then I I figured out maybe you guys do not have prerequisite info on linear algebra as yet. So I thought that is something I might want to cover and sprinkle sometime uh, on at least not and everything about linear algebra, but at least on what eigen decomposition or SVD or like you know these things are. Uh, but the good thing that happened after that was when I looked at this, the thing is PCA and MDS are, are basically techniques that are based on eigen decomposition, right? These are literally applications of eigen decomposition. Uh, so was spectral clustering, right? So I think what I will do today is I will briefly describe something, some linear algebra a little bit about uh, the eigen decomposition or the SVD, which is known as singular value decomposition. And then we can quickly jump into these two techniques as applications, right? Um, so, uh, PCA, by the way, I, I will not jump into it, but it was very popular, especially in the face recognition uh, side of things. So if you see, yeah, so half of this guy's slide, the first half was about PCA, and then second half was about you know applying face recognition. You know, uh, this was this is like whenever people say PCA, and then people ask for a project. Anyone who knows about it literally say, hey, go for face recognition. But now the thing is, there are a lot of other beautiful techniques, wonderful techniques. You don't necessarily need PCA to do face recognition, but PCA has done great uh, in terms of face recognition uh, over the past. Uh, it continues to do it. It's not the only way now. There are other ways to do it as well. Uh, and you can use SVM and random forest for face recognition too, as long as you can generate the right features uh, from your images. Uh, and then there's a popular technique called, I'm just giving some overview before I go into the technicality, it's called Eigen Faces. This was developed by uh, uh, Alex Pentland is still a professor in uh, MIT. Um, it became a very popular paper. Basically, he uses uh, the idea of PCA and all that kind of stuff for, uh, and you know, eigen decomposition for face recognition. Um, so it's a very popular technique. Um, another thing I wanted to show is how popular it really is. So if I just did eigen faces in Google Scholar, so yeah, you will see. This paper by Alex, the mighty professor, I was talking about an eigen face, where he used eigen decomposition for face recognition um, and PC and stuff. Got cited like what seven, six, seventeen thousand times, close to seventeen thousand. So it was like a game changer back then. But now, if you look at the paper, you will find it very simple actually. Uh, but back then, I can imagine why it was a game changer. Okay, so uh, I said the foundation was about eigen decomposition. So let's. Just talk about eigen decomposition. What that really is. It's very popular. Um, you, you will have the eigen function in MATLAB, R, Python, everywhere. Anywhere you do even minor scientific computing, you'll have eigen and SVD available. So you don't have to load packages for it either, uh, unless you're doing some variation of it, some specific. So a few things here. I won't have to scribble too much either. It will be easy. I want to keep it simple. But you can always ask questions if you want me to go into more depth. Okay, so um, we are dealing with matrices when we talk about eigen decomposition, and I'm sure you guys know what a matrix is in the simplest form, right? You have, say, let's let's deal with a matrix called A, for example. Uh, let's, and then the matrices that we deal with in eigen decomposition are symmetric, which, which means that. Uh, and even before I go to that, let's give some dimension to it. It's going to be a square matrix for eigen decomposition. So, n rows and n columns. So it can be a 100 by 100 matrix, 1000 by 1000 matrix. It cannot be a 100 by 200 matrix, where you have 100 rows and 200 columns. This is row, this is column dimension. Okay, and then uh, for SVD though, which is another decomposition, singular value decomposition, you can have rectangular matrices. You can have N by P, where N and P are not the same. Right? You can have some number of rows and some different number of columns within your A matrix. Okay, so this is your matrix or like a data frame. Uh, but this is a numerical, you won't have letters and strings in it. So it's more like a matrix numerical matrix so 
Eigen decomposition applies to square matrices. We call these square because rows and columns same size. And then it also applies to symmetric matrices. Um, if you don't remember or if you do remember, well and good. Symmetric matrix is when the entry, any any entry A, I, J, it's like a very simple thing, is equal to the, is exactly equal to A, J, I. Okay. Any question, anytime, please stop me, right? Don't hesitate about anything. Uh, as far as questions go. So A, I, J equal to A, J. It means, which means entry in A, 1, 2. So first row and second column, whatever entry you have, is going to be the exactly same as the entry you have in second row and first column. So. So basically, if you visualize like a cartoon, right? So these are your rows and columns. So, so I drew four columns. So if I'm talking about symmetric, I have to drew, draw four rows. Or I have to change the cartoon. Now you have four rows, four columns. This is a four by four matrix, n equal to four. Symmetric means A, I, J. So A, first row, second column. This entry is exactly equal to this entry. This entry is exactly equal to uh, this entry. Because 1, 3 is what this location is. This is 3, 1, right? This is the basic stuff that you've studied uh, in high school and later about matrix notation. And so any entry, so every row will be, so if you transpose it, transpose means if you make the row as a column or column as a row, it will be the same thing. You know, the matrix won't change because this is same as this. So if this second row becomes second column, that kind of thing. Uh, I mean, also, obviously, the... Uh, this this doesn't impact the diagonals anyway because a i i is equal to a i i anyway right because i and j are same then a one one so this is here this value is different from this value of course a one one is different from a two two I'm not saying they're necessarily the same but a one two is the same as a two one a two four is same as a four two this this value it is symmetric so basically if you have upper diagonal elements and including the diagonal elements you can completely replicate what is in the bottom diagonal of the of the square matrix. Okay, so this is the matrices we are talking about, and we are talking matrices with real numbers, so it's not complicated. It only has real numbers in it, numbers in it. Um, nothing, no complex numbers is what I meant, but anyway. Um, so now eigen decomposition applies to square matrices that are symmetric, right? Square real matrices that are symmetric. So what is eigen decomposition? So the, the theorem is every such matrix, every symmetric square matrix um, can be decomposed by decomposed, I mean, can be written exactly equal to this structure, u times lambda times u transpose. Now, I'll tell what u is, what lambda is, of course. Okay. u is a matrix. Lambda is also a special matrix. u is another matrix. u transpose is the another matrix. Um, you know what a transpose is, right? So, transpose means I'm making the row as column. So, if I have a matrix 1, 2, with entries 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, seven, eight, nine, if, the, if I call this as my A matrix, for example, then my A transpose, the transpose operation denoted by A T, T on the top superscript is as simple as, is, is given by, you're making the rows as columns, right? So it will become one, two, three will become not row now, it will become first column. Four, five, six for second row, it will become second column now, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine was your third row here, so it became third column. Rows become columns. So your data was one, two, three, but now you have one, four, seven, four, five, six, eight. but this is the A transpose, okay? Now if I transpose this again, obviously, A transpose, transpose, then again I will get A, because you can see, if I put one, four, seven row, if I put it as column, I get one, four, seven. Two, five, eight, two, five, eight, three, six, nine, three, nine. So, so this is a operation, it is not like once you do it, you lost everything. You can bring it back. If you just transfer it again, you get the same thing. Not, no information is lost by the way. It commutes back. Okay, so that is what this transpose notation is. So all you have now is I'm saying every matrix, square matrix that is symmetric can be written in using only two matrices, U and lambda of special kind, where uh, the equation is A equal to U times lambda, again times u transpose. u transpose is just the transpose of this matrix, just like this. The rows in u will become the columns in transpose. Now, there, I said there is some special structure to lambda. Lambda will always be a diagonal matrix, means what? It is again same, it is another n by n matrix, because your data was n by n, this is also n by n. And what is a diagonal matrix? It means only its diagonal entries will have values. Everything else is zero. All these are zeros. These are all zeros. All zeros. So you only have entries. So that's it. It's a ma diagonal matrix. Okay. It's a special matrix. 
So lambda will always be a diagonal matrix, and u will be uh, as follows. Uh, n by u will be another n by n matrix. U transpose will be the trans. I told about u transpose being the trans. This will have numbers everywhere. It's not like only diagonal. So any, uh, this is applicable only to square matrix. This is yes. Eigen decomposition is only applicable to square symmetric matrices. Um, SVD, which is another very very popular decomposition, singular value decomposition, is applied to is applicable to rectangular matrices as well. Okay. Okay. So now. In terms of again notation, so I told you what this is. Uh, this is theorem. So you give me any square matrix, whatever numbers you put in the world here, I can come up with a u and lambda and say, hey, multiply this. I will, I will guarantee, uh, you know, all the money in the world that uh, it will exactly be equal to the matrix you gave me. Right? I can come up with such a u and lambda. This is a equality, the theorem. All right. Now, in terms of again terminology, this u is known as eigenvectors. The columns of u are known as eigenvectors. Eigenvectors. E V. I don't want to write it now here. Eigen E I G E N, right? And then so obviously columns of your eigenvectors, rows of U will U transpose will be eigenvectors because columns become. Rows. And lambda, I said only diagonal entries will have values. Everything else zero. Those diagonal entries are known as eigenvalues. So these are eigenvectors. Is uh, U? Will, these are eigenvalues. Eigen is a German word. Uh, I do, I forgot what it means. I read some history long ago. <laughs> anyway. Or maybe it's the name of the scientist or something. Anyway, it is a very popular uh, uh, equation, eigen decomposition. Now, people, and also another thing, uh, uh, it will also satisfy this equation. Your eigen vectors will have this property. I mean, there are a lot of properties, but some important properties I'll share. That matrix that you took, and if you take its eigen vectors, which is U. If you multiply a with u, what will you will get is a u equal to lambda u. This is another property that will happen. Uh, and how is that happening? It is happening because there is a notion of inverse, right? Have you heard of matrix inverse? So what happens is, if I write an equation, if I send this this side, uh, it will become inverse, right? So uh, I will I will say why this is true. This is this is just a result of this. I'm not. This is not second theorem. This since this is true, this will also be true. Okay. Uh, I, I'm sh I'll show you why. Because if you send u this side, it is known as right inverse. Or if you send this thing u transpose this side, it's known as left inverse. So let's send say this guy this side. So you will have a u transpose came this side, but it became inverse. Okay, is equal to what is left this side? Only u times lambda is left. Now, since diagonal, this is a lambda is a diagonal matrix. U lambda is the same as lambda u. Uh, and by the way, these are not like. I hope you uh, recognize this. The multiplication I'm doing between matrices is matrix multiplication. It's not. I'm not multiplying first number with in u with first number in lambda in, or this second entry with this first row second entry. I'm not doing that. I'm doing a matrix multiplication. So you can definitely look up what matrix multiplication is. But the operation is. When I multiply one matrix another, the first row of A gets multiplied by the first column of whatever matrix I multiplied. Second, right? That that will become first entry. Then, if I multiply with first row with second column, that will become one two entry after the multiplication. Anyway, so all these are all matrix multiplications. Okay, so A U transpose inverse is equal U lambda. But the good thing is U has another property, beautiful property, which is the following. U is known as an orthonormal matrix, which which means U times U transpose. Will give you the identity matrix is equal to I. What is identity matrix? It is a diagonal matrix where all the entries in the diagonal are just one. So I said diagonal matrix. Diagonal can be any values, right? But if your diagonals are always all one, then it is known as an identity matrix. U U transpose is equal to I. Right? I is like one in in numbers. Okay, in real numbers. If I multiply three with one, I get three. So I is like identity. It doesn't change the matrix multiplication. So if I do U A times I, it is exactly equal to A. If I do u times i, it's exactly equal to u. So i is like identity; it's like one. It's, and if you have a matrix with all zeros, it is like zero, right? So it's the i, it's the identity operation. I hit, I multiply a a million times with i, even then I will get a. A will not change anywhere; it will stay there. Okay, now u will is a, has a, this eigenvectors have another property; they are orthonormal, which means u u transpose equal to i. 
Uh, what does orthonormal mean? I mean, I can keep going. This is a linear algebra class. At some point, I will stop, you know, sharing my knowledge on linear algebra. But, uh, but yeah, I'm sharing these only facts that are relevant. Okay, I think with this I can stop actually. If you know this, that any matrix can be diagonalized or writing like this, you know what eigen decomposition the equation is. And this 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 will also satisfy the same thing as this equation. Um, and I was trying to say why this equation will satisfy this equation and what is the significance of that. So let's finish that part, then I'll tell you the significance, then we are done with at least a primer or like intro on eigen decomposition for, for now, a small intro. All right. So so since I said u u transpose equal to i, which means u trans if I send u transpose that side, I will have u transpose inverse, right? I will have u okay, wait, I can write here. U this this equation now u transpose I'm sending that side right for example I'm having u transpose inverse I can put this in a bracket times i on the left hand side I have this u left this u transpose on that side right oh sorry it will be i times u trans u, u transpose inverse uh, okay u is equal to this i times u transpose inverse. I said i multiplied with anything is just like one multiplied with anything so it will i is there or not doesn't matter which means u is equal to u transpose inverse which means u transpose inverse is equal to u right so a u is equal to u lambda u lambda is the same as lambda u why because lambda is a diagonal matrix if, if u, lambda was not a diagonal matrix then u times some matrix is not the same as that matrix times other you know u a times b will not be equal to b times a only if b is la a diagonal matrix or only if a is diagonal or if only if both are diagonal so we got a u equal to lambda u so we proved from this statement if this is true then this is also 100 percent true a u equal to lambda u just proved just proved. what we didn't do anything high five we just took the properties of u that it is this and then we we, we send things to see that side and that side this is like proving some simple equations in high school right uh, with normal equations, right? Uh, not like with matrix. Equation. Same thing. I moved symbols here and there. I got the exact proof. Now, what is the significance of this property? So, this is telling if I take any matrix and multiply it with its eigenvectors, the eigenvectors will stay exact. Uh, so it's not a u equal to lambda u. Sorry, a x equal to yeah, yeah a u equal to lambda. U. It means the eigenvectors will stay the same. It will not change, but they will get scaled by a scalar value, which is a lambda. So, which means, let me draw a pictorial representation of a u equal to lambda u. What, that does, what does that mean? Okay. Say this is one vector. This is one first eigenvector. Say I have two eigenvectors. Say this is another eigenvector. Right? Now, if a, so this is my u. One column this is another column of u. Now, if I multiply a matrix a with its own eigenvectors u, I said I will get u again it will not change at all but it will get scaled by some value equal to lambda u lambda is a diagonal entries right which means each each eigenvector is being scaled which means if lambda is a big number it will be in the same direction but when i multiply with a its its length will increase it will become either bigger or it will become shorter but direction is same this eigenvector is same direction it will either become bigger or it will become shorter so only the direction, I'm only scaling the eigenvector. So this is the property basically, ax equal to lambda x. A lot of uh, systems in in real world, in physics or in computer science are modeled by this. By the way, our Google search algorithm, you know, Sergey Brin and Larry Page, the founders of Google, um, they came up with their algorithm for how Google will do ranking, right? You Google ranking. So your input data is some graph of websites and hyperlinks and how good what website is collecting to everything. All that is your input data, a lot of data engineering, of course. But then the Google ranking algorithm, the technique is known as page rank. Google might have obviously modified it and improved it a little more, but then it's called page rank, P-A-G-R-A-N-K. And what is page rank? It is an SVD or eigen decomposition or eigen, one of these application of this so literally they specify what matrix they what is their a they will specify google guys specified and they said let's do page rank and use your eigenvectors and then eigenvalues so that will be your ranking scores so this so so uh, the reason i was saying this is eigen decomposition is every day, everywhere in our world we're using it it's not just like in some abstract math textbook right we use it in Google works on page rank um, and so on and so forth. There are many examples. Even in uh, the, the the idea of how pendulum works, how 
then you stretch a string, how it will work. All these things in physics are based on eigen decomposition. Lot of things in mechanical engineering, so on and so forth. So this is the eigen decomposition. Um, now PCA and MDS for our purposes are the two techniques we are caring about in our lecture. These are also direct applications of eigen or SVD, uh, eigen decomposition for now. Okay. Um, so, and this is actually, this property is not trivial if you are using some other matrix, because if you take a matrix A, give me any other matrix that is not eigenvector matrix, okay? So give me some matrix B if you want. If I multiply A with B, it will never, like, it will never in this world will give you lambda times B. If it gave you, then I will say B is eigen eigenvector. B is U. Because if I say do eigen one, you'll get the same. Otherwise, you'll never get that because it is as straightforward, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. Say I'm writing an A matrix, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. This is my A matrix to start with. Then if I did not take U as being, B as being my eigenvectors, so I took some other matrix, whatever number you give me. Say you give me, I don't know, two, nine, three, zero, four, six, five, three, two, right? If I multiply this with this, there is no way you will get the same answer. There will no way you will get the same answer on this side with some scalar multiplication. What lambda means scalar, right? So which means first row is multiplied with some value, the second, which one, two, three will become some multiple. It will become two, four, six, or that's what lambda times B is doing. Uh, that operation will never happen because if you multiply everything is getting full jumbled up right you're getting completely different numbers because what is this first row times first column that's how you multiply two matrices right means one times two is two uh, two times zero is zero three times five is 15 so 15 plus two is 17 so the result of this multiplication first entry is 17 in your matrix even there there itself you saw right things are changing so much but now you can say maybe my lambda was 17 so that same lambda times the original matrix 1 is 17, so maybe it is good. But then let's see second value. Yeah. 2 times uh, 4 is 8. Three, uh, 2 times 9 is 18. 3 times 4 is 12. Um, sorry, what did I do? Sorry, 1 times 9. Yeah, 1 times 9 is 9. 9 plus 2 times 4 is 8, which is 17. 17 plus 3 times 3 is 9. 17 plus 9 is what? Uh, 26. So you got 26. Now it is a proof, right? That this is impossible. Uh, unless B is, because if you scaled it, if you said lambda was uh, 17, then 17 times two is 34, but you have 26 here. If you said lambda was 13, 13 times two is 26, that's fine. But 13 times one is not 17. So it is impossible that this equation is possible. This is only possible for this very unique matrix, which is not changing the direction of your eigenvectors. It is only changing the length of your eigenvector. It is scaling them as bigger number or smaller number. If lambda was 0.01, this, this vector would have become a smaller vector. It will be same direction. Okay, that is what eigen decomposition is. All right, so time for PCA. Any questions on that eigen side? Okay, so oh, this was not my slides. So I was showing this slide, yeah. Okay, PCA, uh, unsupervised learning, like I said. Yeah. Also doing dimensional reduction, we will see why. Um, high dimensional data, learning low dimensional representation. This is like this an outline. What is PCA examples, right? Yeah. As you see, PCA definition, objective function, the solution is eigenvector and eigenvalues. Algorithm for finding eigenvector eigenvalues. Then application of PCA for some examples, face recognition, image compression, you know, so many things. Um, all right. You know what big data is, high dimensional data is, this is, we don't need this, this is just another example. Some brain imaging data is high dimensional, you know, a lot of data is high dimensional these days. Okay, so we don't need all of this. Now, this is the, this is the core, so this is what we need. You see in the outline again. All right, PCA has begun. So, um, this is cartoon, this is not PCA yet, it's trying to motivate something. So. Say you had uh, uh, a three-dimensional data, right, here. Uh, the question is, can I represent the same data with two columns instead of three columns, is one question. That is the question of dimensional reduction. Can we represent the same data properties with a lower d-dimensional uh, set of data, right? 
So if you can figure out how the transformation is done, then you're set. So PCA is doing one that kind of a transmission. So why do you even want to do this? Is all some cartoon motivation. It's not solid inf information yet. So for example, say you had a data set like this, right? If you see how the data is varying, forget about math and all, just cartoon, looking at it, right? Intuition, no, not intuition, but looking at it. Right? If you see the data is varying in this direction a lot, right? Because in this direction, there is a lot of variability because point in here is very different from point in here. A lot of variation from center to this direction. But in this direction, the variability is a lot lesser relatively than this direction because here data varied from this small number to this large number. But in this direction, data is varying from this small number to slightly increased number in this direction. Not much variance. Okay. Um, so you have this and this. Then you, someone can say somewhere in the middle, like this direction. Then that may be the third most variance, this or this direction. And then you can take some direction where it doesn't vary at all. Uh, right? So that is exactly the intuition for PCA. If you want to represent this data, say this is 2D data. This is not say, this is 2D data, right? You have x-axis, you have y-axis. Every point is represented by two, 2D. So if you had 1000 points, your data set has two variables with 1000 points. 1000 by 2 matrix is your input data frame, input data set, input SQL table, whatever it is. 1000 rows, 2 columns, for example. Or it could be million rows, 2 columns, but 2 columns are fixed. Now say I want to do dimensional reduction. I want to preserve the properties in the data. Some property, we'll, take, we'll talk about what property, some properties in the data. But I want to represent it with only one column. I don't want two columns to represent this data. I want to represent only one column. Then what is your best bet? Since there is more variability in here, you want to represent by some direct in some some line in this direction and project all those points onto that line, and say, okay, this line, the, the points on that line, however they fall, that will be my one-dimensional representation. Then I don't need two axes, only one axis. You know, it's like number line. Uh, but if say two axes are required, then you need one column, this one column. That is, so this is known as the first principal component based on variability. This is the second principal component. You see this little way? This is the second principal component. So that. If, you, if I put in two principal comments and my data is 2D, my principal comments are 2D, I have not changed the dimension yet, but I have expanded it through a different angle, a different way of looking, different axes. Instead of this axis that you guys are used to, I'm giving you these axes as my data. Okay, that is the idea of PCA. The idea is, it's all about variance and covariance, right? So you want to look at what projection, if you project onto what line, uh, if you want one principal component, one line. If you want five principal components, five lines. We'll maximize, uh, we'll, uh, such that that product, projected data will explain your variance the max. This is the exact one direction like this in that day, in that particular example. Oh, by the way, this is from Andrew and as well. I didn't know that. I don't know why they're using it in CM yet. All right, PCA. Okay, so how do we do that? So since we are talking all about variances, Solution is very simple. It is an eigen solution. Your input, I said eigen decomposition is ax equal to lambda x, right? Here x, here a is being used by this matrix. For x is using the v matrix. For lambda is using lambda. So here again, you have to see. I can change symbols and names, but the equation is still the same. You take a square symmetric matrix. This matrix is square symmetric matrix x times x transpose. And if you can write it as some vector multiplied by some vectors, some matrix, and then it, the matrix will not change. It will only scale, big or small. Then this is eigen decomposition of x, x, y. So the only v and lambda that satisfies this are the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of this matrix. Okay. So what is x, x transpose, by the way? x, x transpose is known as the correlation or the covariance matrix. Only if you center your data. x is your input data, by the way. Okay. So you have input data, right? Say this input data is, say you had 100, I, didn't, I cannot count all how many blue points, say you have 1000 points here. You have 1000 points in blue in two dimensions. So your data x is 1000 by 2. It will have literally this point, first point maybe minus 2 comma 0. Second point 2 comma minus 2. Another point 4 comma something. Another point is 0. 0.5 comma something. You, know, you have those 1000 by 2 x matrix. Now, all you do is you center this matrix, which means you subtract the mean from each matrix so that each row in your data will have same shape but it will have an average of zero. You are just centering it, you are just moving it. That is known as the centered x matrix. Now if you compute with the centered matrix xx transpose, what you get is known as correlation or covariance matrix. I am sure you guys might have heard of what correlation means or covariance. Or you at least heard of these terms, right? Correlation and covariance are not exactly the same thing by the way. So this is known as the covariance matrix. Uh, they are only same in specific cases. 
so uh, so if basically what is I, pca you take covariance matrix of your data okay, your data is x you compute covariance matrix which is this and then compute eigen decomposition of that then you get v's and lambdas so the your columns of your eigen vectors are your first principle are your principal uh, so that is the solution of pca why is it the solution? It's something that he did not mention here, but I can mention it separately in our cartoon yeah. when I do the drawing. So that is your eigen error. So this is a direct application of R. So I, basically eigen decomposition applied to covariance matrices gives you principal component analysis, gives you this algorithm. Okay. Now the question is how many eigenvectors to use, right? Do you want to reduce to two dimension, three dimension? If you had hundred dimensions, there are 10 dimensions. So it is decided based on, uh, on based on the simple intuition of how many eigenvectors will explain most of the variance in your data. So you have 100% variance. This eigenvector maybe have explained 90% of the variance. This direction has explained another 5%, nine, maybe another 7%. So 97% is explained already. Then the question is, okay, let's not care about third 3%. Or maybe let's care about 3%. Based on that, you can go with another third principal component. It will be this, saying, this direction or this direction. Otherwise, two or more than enough. You reduce your dimensionality. Uh, well, not here. If you have 3D data, then you reduce to 2. If you only use first principle, you reduce from 2 to 1. And you're also looking at what your data in a different uh, perspective, what angles matter most. Now, let me give you a nice example I really like. Prime uh, PCA. Let's see. Google images will show this. Somewhere. Yeah, this one. I like this. Like, why does it make Like, I, we talked a bunch of math, but what, what is it? mean to someone who's doing business or whatever right so let me show you that yeah here Oops. okay this is better okay say i took crime counts um, of some kind right maybe burglary or maybe some violent crime whatever one kind of crime for example, from all states 50 states and then i also took what kinds of crimes collecting some maybe urban population related crimes, some rape some assault some murder you know this is mostly violent crimes apparently okay so if i do pca on that data set then my that data set this is a real data set it ended up giving something like this these are red things are my principal components okay it said most of the these four are the top four principal components that explain most of the variance in the data is what they said right maybe it explained 90 personal variance in your data now then let us see i will not i did not use the fact that what crime type it is i just took one kind of data about uh, which state how many crimes that kind of thing but then it, it showed very interesting directions it happened that then I saw why this direction, these states are there, what is common, right? Not I, I mean, I'm looking at the, whoever did this. So New Jersey, Washington, Ohio, Oregon, Oregon, Delaware, you know, these, in this direction, urban population related crimes are a little more popular, uh, apparently. And rape is an issue in this direction of states, apparently, Missouri, Texas, Illinois, bigger issue here. Assault is a bigger issue in Maryland, right? Uh, Baltimore, New these areas. Murder is more of an issue in Georgia, Atlanta, Alabama. I mean, I lived in Atlanta. I definitely know there's a lot of uh, crime happening in Atlanta and all that. You know, a lot of gang stuff and shootings and all that. It's like kind of like that, right? But a lot better. It's a great city, though. Right? But I can see I'm able to connect. I, I know about uh, solving a problem in Maryland, Baltimore. I'm not very sure about rape or urban population issues in these areas. So. It is giving you some nicer representations about your data that you did not know in first hand because this was not used in generating the principal comment. You generated that and then people start looking and they said, oh, okay, this is what it is showing. And maybe these four, four crimes are more than enough to explain the variance in all of these states. Right? So that is known as, uh, that is uh, all about PCA, for example. Uh, it is giving an interesting representation of what direction you want like how do you explain the variance in your data there is some variability these are close by these are close by but these states are different from these states there's some big white space in the middle right gap what is it why are these close by why are these close by what is what is the direction that is explaining this version what is it where these states where are these states where are these states these states so there is, will be some principal comments that explain these states as well of course these guys showed four uh, so that is pca um, it will give you interesting insights into your data 
So you're exploring your data through interesting directions. It is showing what direction you have to go to explain most of the variability. Because variability is where you can see interesting stuff. Let's do PCA examples. Yes. Yeah, that's another one. And then we also have let's do it just do one quicker example. Maybe this is more than enough. Hmm. Okay, yeah. If you see here, they had some lot of data and apparently one direction explains education-related points. One direction, health, transportation, similar. Again, climate, housing, crime, recreation, economics, right? So, so yeah. just looking at the blob of data, you'll, principal comments will tell you what directions you need to look into it because there's a lot of variance. You're swimming into that. You're like, you're like swimming through the data, right? So you want to see what directions explain what. So that's what he's showing in this. Uh, similarly, here he was showing something. So for example, here, right? You have data set like this. You can see here, this part is has one nice interesting variance in this direction. This direction is lesser than this direction. Here, more variance in this direction. Some variance in this direction, some variance in this direction as well. So, those could be your principal components, for example. Some principal components this side, and maybe one or two principal components this side. To explain most of your data. Why is this useful? It is there basically, PC is one way of generating features from your data, which would be useful in predicting something or classifying something. So PCA can be like a pre-processing step or exploratory data analysis where you can use your principal components as uh, as features for your problem that you're trying to work on. Say if you're working on face recognition. This is what he's showing. The X I said you have to center, right? So he's subtracting every the mean from all columns of your data. So then this is a centered matrix. Then if you do excess transpose, you get the, the covariance. And what is covariance by the way? You know what variance is, right? How is the numbers varying from its mean value? Covariance means if you have two columns, how is the variability in one influencing the variability in second column? Which means the first column, if say if it is very high variability, second column also has variability at the same time, then they're highly, they have high covariance. But if sec one value is going in one direction, you are not able to predict the covariance, the variance of another value. They are not dependent variances. They are varying in their own, their own, uh, you know, uh, ways. They are not varying similarly. That is the covariance matrix, by the way. So, so we've seen that it's all about a computing co uh, covariance matrix and applying uh, computing eigenvectors, then you get this direction. Now the question is, why is it explaining the variances, right? Uh, uh, because and why is it why is the solution eigenvectors that's another thing right uh, so what you wanted to do was you wanted to uh, find a matrix oh, so okay here c is your covariance matrix you wanted to find a projection say x uh, so that uh, it explains the maximum the most of your covariance so so basically uh, that can be written in this form this is just pythagoras theorem um, so, so that you want to explain most of the covariance uh, with those uh, eigenvectors. So, this thing, if you, this can be written in this form. If you do the, this is a vector, right? This is a Caesar matrix. So, if you do matrix multiplication, you can be written as wi, wj times cij. So, so basically, you want to maximize the variance. You want to find. So, w x is not what you want to find. W is what you want to find. X is your data set, right? So, you want to find uh, the maximum of this. You want to find a direction with which you want to multiply the covariances so that most of the covariances are explained by it. You want to find such a W. So this thing is exactly same as finding the eigenvectors uh, of C. Why is that? So he didn't mention here. It is because there is a theorem called 
Rayleigh quotient. This again, we are going deeper into linear algebra. Uh, Rayleigh quotient, which will tell you when you have something x transpose mx kind of a thing, uh, and if you are trying to maximize it, the theorem says the maxima is only obtained by based on eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So you actually have to be eigenvectors. That's what it is. This is a, this is a very popular theorem for people who do linear algebra. So. If you want to maximize, find directions, you basically if you want to find vectors that maximize, so you have data set like a cartoon I showed, right? You have covariances, you want to find directions of vectors that will explain the covariance the maximum possible, that is explained by this, you want to find Ws that find the maximum possible directions uh, of explaining the, your covariance and that solution based on Rayleigh's quotient theorem, such a maxima can only be obtained by eigenvectors, so if you obtain the eigenvectors, you get the solution, that's why it's competing eigenvectors. The same thing I'm repeating again. You can also do SVD if your data set was kind of um, rectangular data set, rectangular matrix instead of, uh, instead of uh, square symmetric matrix, then you can do SVD. SVD means U, D, V. So U and V will not be the same. You will have U, V, transpose. So this is in case of rectangular matrix. So that's where the slides end. Um, we want to look at, so we looked at PCA in the simple slides. So now face recognition, right? So I said PCA can be used as features, right? Because you have these images, you can directly use these numbers to predict. Uh, so here the idea, what are you trying to classify? You're trying to identify a specific person based on facial image. And it, your identification has to be robust to glasses. Because if I wear glasses one day, the computer should not say I'm another person and not give me access into the building or not allow me to open my ATM account, whatever. Right? So you wear glasses or not, you're smiling or not, lighting is dark or not. Regardless, if it's, a, it's your face recognition, if it's a good system, it should be robust to it. It's not bothered. But if it is again me and say my brother, it should not say I am my brother or my brother is myself, right? It should not be the same thing. Two people, different people should be different. Same person with variation should be allowed. So how people, you can apply SVM on this data set, but uh, what people used to do is they used to come generate PCA. You will get your eigenvectors so, uh, of your data set. So these, if you plot your eigenvectors, this is the signature. So there's a PCA representation of images. So the same images, if you plot only the eigenvectors, you get this. And then you can use that as your input features. And then you can apply, uh, yeah, he went to next example. On those features, if you apply, uh, so one, one thing you can do is even simple. You don't even apply any SVM. You use these eigen features to match. So if I go in, what will happen is, they'll take my photo. Say if this was me, it's not me, say this photo. They'll take my photo. They'll have, they have already had PCA, so they will, they had stored my PCA version of internally first time. So next time again, they will say PCA. They will get this representation of my face. So then they will know oh, this is this person. So PCA is capturing enough information to explain the variability. It's not capturing everything. Because if I compare, computer is kind of stupid sometimes, right? Because if I, if, if I was this guy, this guy is this guy, same guys. But here he's wearing glasses, here he's not wearing glasses. So if I compare exactly, then computer will say not exact match. Then the question is, how much variability should I allow for and how much should I not allow for? So that kind of compression, where you're preserving enough variability but not preserving everything is what eigen decomposition is doing, right, the PCA. It's explaining some variability, it's not explaining exact variability, same thing. So it is only capturing enough signature that is enough to match and say, I'm the same person regardless of whether I wear glasses, I smile or not. If I, maybe if I, you know, shave my head and go, maybe it will not capture. But otherwise, reasonable changes, it will it will understand the same thing. So that's what is going on. It will see PCA version, it will match. Oh, this guy is the same guy. Is this guy same guy as this guy? He wore glasses, not, not much different, something like that. And it will do the matching. That's how face recognition is being done. Okay. Even apparently it is robust to lighting conditions, glasses, all these things. All right, so this is not the only way. There are, of course, a lot of newer things came after that. But PCA is still popular in exploring data. Another application is, using supervised learning, using PCA. This is what we are showing here. Say you have some data set, right? Your data, say your data was 60 dimensional data, 144 dimension of rows, so much data, right? And say you want to reduce to 16 dimensional data, right? Then they took 16 most important eigenvectors, means 16 principal components, eigenvectors of the covariance matrix of your data set. And six most means this. So you can reconstruct your data using only those eigen components. But then the application is this. This is used in general. So you can use your PCA features. You can use that as your input to your supervised algorithm. You can use logistic, neural network, SVM, random version, that version of your data set to do your classification and everything. That's what he's showing here. 
So you can apply whatever technique. There is another good application. PCA to just generate features that are useful. You can use original features, you can use PCA features, you can use both as well. So it's a way of generating features, feature generation, feature learning. This area is called deep uh, representation learning. You want to learn new representation. PCA is just one way of doing that. So that's what we discussed. Um, um, so now, guys, do we go into another topic or give it a break? We are at 10. Um, feel free to comment on uh, where you are right now or we can because since if we plan to catch up again one week then we can cover everything there as well it's up to you um i think we went little off track because we had some discussions but of course it was important discussion as well um i want some comments from you guys do you want to go ahead i think anyway when next week we are planning to summarize in right so we can use 30 minutes to summary and 30 minutes yes okay Perfect. All right. So we have a discussion on table. All right. Let's do that. Let's let's do 15, 30, 15 to 30 minutes of summary and discussion. So in summary, I will just show you what what is the landscape, what is there, what else you can do, so that you can take you do your own independent learning as you go in your career. Then other 30 minutes you can cover, uh, I guess, MDS for a little time. MDS is again again an example of uh, eigen decomposition as well, so it'll be even faster. I will also tell in next class how they are doing the reconstruction, right? Because you are seeing. Uh, a reconstructed version. I don't know where that is here. Right. So this is your compressed version, right? Say more and more compression. Original data after compression, the, you know, clarity rate is a little bit. Even more compression rate is given a little bit. But how are they compressing and reconstructing? Compressing means you are getting principal vectors. Again, why are you getting a reconstructed version? That I will explain, and that is also useful in MDS next time. And then we can go and do summary as well. So. And we can catch up. I don't know about ANOVA. I'm not honestly sure, but let's try to fit. Let's do a one and a half hour course. Uh, it's actually week next time. That way we cover all three aspects. Finish MDS, finish summary and discussion of the landscape. Third thing, finish some more of ANOVA and uh, confidence intervals. That will finish 100% of what we put on our syllabus. All right. Have a good weekend. Uh, let's catch up. Uh, yeah, I think Hemant will let us know, I guess, he'll work it out on when this would be and what time and all that. It's all of us. We can figure that out in the thread or on WhatsApp. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Sure. No, no problem. So I asked, and do both of you guys, if that's what you plan to do, just do it uh, basically. And I think you could both send in an email. Um, uh, I don't think you need to give them a lot of explanation of why. Just say that, uh, and that's just not working out for you guys. Uh, like whatever other comments you have. Right? And you can, you can CC the email to me um, and then, of course, you're going to ask me, I'll tell them to tell hey, you. Hey, you yeah, must have been lucky. Okay. Sure. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. So, uh, yeah, and moving forward, um, if you guys uh, ever need any help, it's just a matter of if it's uh, data science topics or whatever. So, Yeah, you must. Good man, thank you. Good luck. We need a mustard. Yeah, good luck. Hey, wait, wait.